Here today, we have the Athletics' Jay Harris, who was at Brentford on Sunday as they beat Crystal Palace without Ivan Tony and our football tactics writer, Liam Tharm, as well. Jay, I know you went back to Brentford, but you know you firmly work for Tottenham now. Uh, but you were there. Brentford played without Ivan Tony on Sunday. You know, a player that's been so instrumental. So when the lineups dropped 75 minutes before kickoff now, which mm -hmm. caught me out, <laughs> Tony was mysteriously absent. Um, so I thought it was a surprise. And then... After the game, we got to speak to Thomas Frank a little bit more about it. He revealed that the decision had actually been made on Thursday. So it's Frank and some senior figures at the club. They they made that call. Um, Tony was in was on board with that decision. He didn't have a problem with it. And it looks like his time at Brentford is coming to an end and that he's going to be going to our Ali and the Saudi Pro League, which I'm a little bit surprised by. And I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit more. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's exactly what I want to ask you, uh, uh, Liam. You know, you know, Ivan Tony after his uh, return from his ban uh, from gambling, spoke about wanting to play for a, a top club, right? Saudi Pro League. I didn't associate those two things coming together based on that statement, right? Yeah, that's that's probably fair. Um, there's numerous probably financial incentives to, to go in there. Um, that's, that's, I suppose, a broader part of a, a player's career at his age as well. Um, you may be looking at, I don't know, you've there's always a finite number of moves left, right? But a specific sort of number of uh, finite moves. And it's it's a league which, you know, some people will dislike it. Some people will like it is growing in terms of the caliber of players that it's attracting. Um, I'm well aware I'm, I'm by no means an expert on the league, but sort of from top to bottom, um, there's not quite sort of the spread of, of sort of wealth or the spread of sort of top talent. It's very much concentrated um, towards those top clubs. But look, we've already seen instances of players sort of going from a European club to a to a Saudi club, possibly then coming back to Europe. So, you know, the idea that this sort of, I think, permanently takes him out of Europe um, for, you know, the rest of his career, perhaps out of the sort of Cristiano Ronaldo type situation, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think is true. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, I suppose, a myriad of ways this, this whole situation could play out now. I think um, it's important for people to understand that Tony, for the majority of his career, was in League Two, League One, Championship, mm -hmm. now in the Premier League. So, he joined Brentford in September 2020, so four years ago, so ahead of their promotion winning season. So he's never signed a Premier League contract. Look, I'm sure that contract was incentivized so that when Brentford got promoted, you know, his salary went up. But he's not on a lot of money compared to what players at rival Premier League clubs are. You know, this is a man who scored 20 goals in 33 appearances in the 22-23 season. And he was probably on way, 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 way less mm. than strikers at other Premier League mm. clubs who were getting five yeah. goals that season. So I don't think it's as cut and dried as maybe some other players who've made a lot of money and have still decided to go to the Saudi Pro League and it's a case of the rich getting richer. I think Tony is probably thinking, well, I actually haven't made a substantial amount of money compared to some of my peers. So I think that's why he's probably a little bit more tempted than this move than he would have thought. But I don't want to get too ahead of myself here, but for people who can remember, when Tony made his return in January against Nottingham Forest, it was billed as this massive thing. You know, it's live on Sky Sports. Mm. Um, Brentford played The Undertaker from WWE's music before kickoff. He scored that free kick. He was smack bang in the conversation straight away. If you'd asked me after that game, where will Tony end up this summer? I don't think anybody, myself included, would have said the Saudi Pro League. So it's definitely mm. been a strange turn of events over the last six, seven months. Yeah, definitely. And something I didn't see coming particularly now, uh, you know, Jay, Brentford, I guess, have earned the right to say perhaps they're one of the best run clubs in the Premier League. Um, but I, I remember Brentford put in a hundred million pound price tag on, on Tony. I, I saw that and I thought, right, I respect the guy and I respect what Brentford are doing right here. But you look at Harry Kane and what he went for to, to buy Munich. This is a seasoned international and you've seen exactly what this player can do, right? Played in the Champions League, played in European football, you know, Mr. Premier League, Mr. Tottenham. Do you think that also had an effect on how clubs were viewing this sale of Ivan Tony potentially? Well, Brentford never officially put a £100 million price tag on him. What happened was Thomas Frank went on Sky Sports and they said, how much do you think he's worth? And he just pointed out that number six is Rice Caicedo. Mm, mm, we're going mm. for 100 million and normally strikers were more. So, yes, he was being very cheeky. He knew what he was doing. Um, I think the important thing to remember is that that summer when Tony was banned, no one was going to come in at that price point for him. But at that point, he had two years left on his contract. He was 27 years old. He's just scored 20 goals. 
it might have seemed like a steep price, but actually compared to other forwards, um, not just strikers, but maybe wingers, etc. I think 80, 90, 100 million was not that unreasonable. I think in January, when Tony made his return, and there was a little bit of chatter about him then, Brentford were in a really bad position in the league. You know, Brian and Boomer was out injured for three months of an ankle injury. Johan Wiss was at the African Cup of Nations. So they're basically playing Neil Mope and Keen Lewis Potter up front. And Keen Lewis Potter's, I think he scored two times in the Premier League. So at that point in time, there was no need for Brentford to sell. The most important thing for them at that point in time is the money they get from being in the Premier League every season. So I think the stars never really aligned there was never really a perfect time to sell Tony. It would have been last summer off the back of that season, but the band just complicated everything. In January, their league position complicated everything. They had to keep him. So I think the price tag was a factor, but then, like I said, the, the optics just were never quite perfect. Mm. I'm just thinking, uh, Liam, about what life looks like for Brentford, you know, now it looks like Ivan Tony's potentially le leaving the club. You know, um, Jay just mentioned uh, Wisa and Buemo, um, who scored. You know, uh, Buemo scored uh, against Crystal Palace, and when he's on fire, he's brilliant. But Brentford have just bought Igor Thiago, and I saw him play for Brugge against Kent uh, last year. Actually, random trip to Belgium, and he was quite Hipster. decent. Yeah, I'm trying, man. I'm <laughs> trying. But real talk, like he's now injured. Yeah. What does that look like and how equipped are Brentford moving forward? Now it looks like their star strikers leaving the leaving the club. It's a fair way to look at it. I think it's actually something Jay and I sort of spoke about, I think, at the start of last season where um there was a big thing sort of from looking at some interviews with Thomas Frank, he kept repeating the phrase sort of adding layers to the team and sort of having this way where against sort of better teams or top six teams, um they play a back five or a back three, they'd be a bit more defensive, um, much more of a low block counter-attacking. And then in games where they felt they could compete, they'd go more 4-3-3. Three, three. They'd look to attack more, have more possession. Um, and it was sort of, we sort of settled on this point that with with Tony, you get a really, really good top-level attacker whose goal output is, is really good. I, I wouldn't quite go as far to say great. He's had one really, really good season. But when you look at sort of his goal return, um, especially for minutes played and you account for the quality of team he's playing in with with all due respect compared to other top teams, um, he's good, but really specific. Um, you've got a player who is a really good sort of jeweler aerially, someone who's not always going to sort of drop in and, and link up, probably needs to play with someone off him, um, either sort of a, a 10 or a sort of second striker. Um, but it meant that they're probably not quite as flexible as they could be now in attack. When you see, especially when you've got Sharda fit um, with Mbomo and Vissa as well, which I know isn't always all the time and you need to have plan B, plan C, etc. But um, I think one thing I have enjoyed seeing and I think the goals against Crystal Palace really sort of sum this up, or the first one especially, how fluid and dynamic Brentford can be actually sort of playing through the thirds. Now, don't get me wrong, that's a much harder way to play in the Premier League to survive than it is by trying to play maybe slightly more underdog football. Um, but I think the overwhelming sort of notion I got from Thomas Frank was they understand that if they want to push on and develop, you can't always play 3-5-2, low block, counter-attack. There's a time and a place for that, but their aspirations clearly are sort of pushing further on. And they both had good returns last season, Visser and Mbwemo, in terms of goals and assists. And as Jay says, that's, you know, with injury, with absences. Um, so it's it's good enough, I think. This is what people forget. When Brentford were one of the most stylish teams in the championship, shall we say, everybody was raving about, you know, the BMW, Ben Rama and Boomer and Watkins. The way that trio combined couldn't have been more different to how Thomas Frank played with Ivan Tony. but you play to the strengths of the players that are with you. I think if you really push Thomas Frank, he'd probably admit that if he had to pick Watkins or Tony, who's the striker that he'd probably prefer to play with week in, week out? He'd probably say it's Watkins, someone who can kind of offer a little bit of a threat in behind, who can pull out wide, etc. So this is just a necessary evolution for Brentford. So I don't think there's going to be any tears that Tony's gone. Yes, it's a shame. You can make a very good argument that he's probably one of the best players in their recent history, if not the overall history. But mm. this is what's happened to Brentford for the last 10 years. They sold Watkins, they sold Ben Rama, they sold others. And now it looks like they're selling Tony too. Yeah. Is there any chat then, Jay, though, um, just to keep him on for another year, get him to run down that contract or for Brentford and the way they operate, that money is important that money is key to reinvest back into the club and, and and keep that sustainability model in which they 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 look to operate 
Yeah, I think staying for one more year and running down his contract only benefits Tony. Brentford are a very well-run club, as we've mentioned a couple of times, and their finances are in a pretty good position. But the only significant sale they've made during their three or so years in the Premier League so far is David Rea to Arsenal for £27 million. Meanwhile, they spent, I think it's €36.5 million Euros altogether on Igor Thiago. I think it's £27.5 million, including add-ons for Carvalho. Mm. Then they've spent at least £20 million on Nathan Collins, Sharder as well well over £100 million on different players. So at some point, they do need to sell somebody. And I think their club record sale is still Ollie Watkins from mm -hmm. four or five years ago. So they know that they should break that comfortably with Tony. Um, and it just allows them to reinvest in, in other areas of the squad. So I think for them, I think in an ideal world, it probably would have been a little bit of a bidding war and they would have had a couple of Premier League clubs driving the price up against each other. Um, but I'm sure they'll accept the money that's coming from from our alley and and be happy regardless. Okay. Well, you are listening to the Athletic FC podcast. Drop us an email if there's something you want to know more about or think we should be discussing. It's tafcpod at theathletic.com. I repeat it again, tafcpod at theathletic.com. Right, let's get back into it and continue to talk Ivan Tony because... Of the clubs linked with a move for Tony, Arsenal were one of the most heavily linked. Here's the Athletics' James McNicholas. Yeah, Ivan Tony and Arsenal is an interesting one just because Arsenal have obviously been in the market for a centre-forward during the last few windows and linked with a wide number of centre-forwards, including Tony, in the media. What I would say is that at most of those times, I think the price tag would have been prohibitively expensive for Arsenal. You know, I think as recently as January or last summer, we were talking a fee of... 70, 80 million pounds. Brentford's demands were pretty high in that kind of region. I think Arsenal would have balked at that, uh, particularly for a player who's Tony's age, 28 now, 29 later this season. And I think, to be honest, that age will also have been part of why that window has passed for him. I think Arsenal generally, their recruitment's been founded on bringing players in their early to mid 20s, guys who are entering the prime of their career. Would there be some concerns maybe about whether Tony would be able to sustain his performance over the next few seasons? I also think it hasn't helped his case that, you know, he didn't play a great deal of football last season. Obviously, he had the ban. I think it was 17 Premier League appearances, four goals. If he had come back absolutely flying uh, and hit the ground running, shown his very best form, then I think things may have been different, but it didn't quite pan out like that. Nonetheless, I am surprised that uh, Saudi Arabia appears to be the destination. I thought there would be a taker within the Premier League, even if, for various reasons, I didn't necessarily think it was ever going to be Arsenal. Yeah, I guess in terms of profile, 28 for a striker probably, as James McNicholas just mentioned, was slightly uh, beyond Arsenal. But you can kind of see how it could work there, Jay. He's ready, right, at link-up play. Um, I watched... Arsenal away at Brentford last season it was one of the games where T uh, Tony came back and he was still trying some audacious stuff against Arsenal from the halfway line. I remember that very vividly, you know. Um, you can see how he could work at Arsenal, surely. Yeah, he's a very intelligent player. And, you know, Liam was just talking about how he always works really well when he's kind of got a second striker. And that was kind of why he was such a success at Brentford. He had Brian and Bumo with him. But I think if you, no disrespect to Brian and Bumo, he's a great player. But mm. if you then put Tony in a situation where he's with Odegaard, Saka, Martinelli, I think he'd only raise his level a little bit more. But we've seen with Arteta over the last couple of years, he likes players that can be flexible. Habits had a brilliant end to the season. He obviously scored on the opening weekend as well. But Habits can play in multiple different positions. Tony is very much a centre forward. He can do one thing well, but he can't really do too much otherwise. So I can understand that in this day and age, a striker like him, you sort of have to adapt your team to his strengths. And Arteta doesn't really want to do that. He's got his principles and it might be too big of a swing to incorporate Tony into that. Yeah, did you buy that, Liam? Yeah, I think I think that's fair. Um, and you have to look at where there's gaps in a team or not, or teams that need that kind of profile. I think Arsenal specifically as well have probably got someone who's have us probably actually a lot more similar to Tony than I think a lot of people sort of realise. They probably don't play in entirely the same way, but I think they fulfil a, a very similar role, and especially them in terms of playing with real sort of wide wingers, you know, and how they like to get their wide overload to being really a box forward a lot of the time to actually, you know, if you look at like a shot map for Kai Havertz, I think a lot of people are surprised at how much for someone that often gets labelled as a, a false nine really tends to get chances like a like a traditional striker. Um, we've obviously had other strikers that come through at Arsenal where, you know, they 
didn't need or like or want to keep following Balogun. Um, he was then sold. You've got someone like Nketiah who can also be that back to goal sort of tight profile. Mm. So it's it's tricky. I think strikers feel like they're getting increasingly more specific. And as Jay says, Arteta is probably a good example of someone who I wouldn't say is necessarily fixed, but clearly has a style that he's he's working towards and would rather. And look, Arsenal now and these top teams are in the luxury where they've generally got quite good academy systems so they can mm-hmm. develop their own talent or they can sell it on to have more funds. And they've got the finances from being in repeat years of Champions League football and and, and success where they can now say, we don't just need to buy this, this guy and sort of make it fit. Whereas Brentford might have to do that a little bit more. We can say, actually, we'll, we'll wait until the right one comes along and then we can sort of throw all of our, um, yeah, throw all of our money at, at that player. Yeah, but you mentioned Kai Havertz, and by the way, Kai Havertz is doing the job for Mikel Arteta, but in terms of shot accuracy and probably goals scored, you probably think Ivan Tony offers just a little bit more? Yeah, possibly. Um, but I think I think one of the big focuses now for a lot of teams is generally around not having a striker that they're reliant on scoring all the goals for. We're in mm. a really weird situation where, obviously, the Premier League's had its goals record broken for the last two seasons. Teams are really, really attack-focused now. But in the Premier League last season, you had uh, 11 different players score more than 15 goals, but only three of them scored more than 20, and that was Haaland, Cole Palmer, and Alexander Isak. So Isak's someone who probably is a nine, but can play off the left as well. Palmer's someone that people associate more as a number 10 or a winger. Haaland's the only one there, really, that is that sort of traditional mm-hmm. box profile number nine. So we're just in this weird sort of uh, tactical phase, I think, where people like goals are really important and they're going in more and more. But I think it's kind of because other positions tend to chip in. You've got a lot of goal scoring wingers and, and wide forwards, number 10s. Um, you've got defenders that can add goals from set pieces. Um, so I think there's not uh, perhaps the... The demand that once quite was for saying we need to get this guy that's going to score 30 goals because that could be a Bakayo Saka, that could be a Gabriel Martinelli, or especially if you put them together, they probably would cover the goals that you might get from a, from a Tony. Okay, brilliant. Well, haven't heard from James McNicholas on Arsenal's interest. What about their Premier League title rivals? There were actually some rumours about Tony to City floating around a couple of weeks ago. And I, I obviously don't mean rumours that you see in the media. Nobody would have seen these headlines, but kind of behind the scenes, agent world, that kind of stuff. And it obviously it got me thinking, surely not. I think the best way to put it is this, if it was FIFA or EAFC 25, and you had Ivan Tony on the bench to bring on for Haaland, or as well as Haaland after 70 minutes, perfect. But in reality, is Tony going to accept a role where he's not playing that much? Everybody knows Erling Haaland is going to play all the games. And I think basically that is what City are looking for now. They are looking for a striker, but not one who's going to come in and expect to play a lot. The whole squad planning is along the lines of, we've got 14, 15 senior players who expect to play all the time. Any more than that could cause problems. Would he have worked at City? His holder play is amazing. It's probably better than Haaland's. The way he holds up long balls in particular, brings others into the game. From penalties, he's, he's better than Haaland from the spot, and Haaland's good. Tony's obviously a really good finisher as well. It would be a great signing for City, but just in terms of that squad balance, in terms of working with Haaland, getting the minutes, that kind of thing, I just think it would throw the whole balance out of kilter a bit. And I think, at the risk of sounding stupid if it were to ever happen, I think that's why City haven't really considered it. And it, it wouldn't actually make sense, despite the fact that on paper, he's a great fit. That was Sam talking about how Ivan Tony probably couldn't work at Manchester City. Uh, Liam, you could probably understand it with someone as prolific as Haaland. I mean, where does he even fit in? They've just lost Alvarez to Atletico Madrid. Yeah, again, it's always a, a squad building thing. To be honest, I'm surprised Guadalupe doesn't want to buy him just so that they guarantee to beat Brentford every season because I know how much he hates playing against Thomas Frank. So <laughs> just, just start buying up the opposition just so they can't beat you. Um, yeah, it's, it's that thing of you think maybe... 10 or so years ago, uh, a profile like Tony's would be even more popular, that his career progression would probably look um, ever so slightly different to now. And it's just it's just the rate at which I think um, clubs are, are starting to change. And you look now in terms of there's a lot more Tony's that are increasingly, or the, the types of player that he is getting bought when you look at how Manchester United have recruited with Rasmus Hoyland and with Joshua Zerchi as well. So teams want that player that can be the focal point, that can score goals. Um, I think there's increasingly demand of a striker that can kind of do a bit of everything to sort of drop in as well and to to press, to link play. Um, and I think then maybe the fact that he is at the age that he is and teams are probably looking at a player who 
might not have that many years at the the top level left and also probably from a resale perspective and then there's the fact that i imagine that you know trying to do recruitment with with brentford first and foremost is when you're a premier league rival regardless of where you're on the table they're probably going to bump you in terms of price so there's probably as well a benefit to brentford of saying we can sell him to a team that's outside of the league we're not going to then go and concede three or four goals to him across the course of a season. So the impact isn't going to hit us as um, as badly. Um, so I think, it, you know, as, as Jay was saying, it needs kind of a lot of things to align up. There's a lot of situations where it can be a theoretically sort of sound fit, but you go, does the club really need him? And do they need him for the cost it's going to, um, it's going to take? Mm, I always think about um, egos, Jay, you know, especially when you're a prolific striker, you want to be number one. You want to be the main man. Uh, it's not going to happen at City if Ivan Tony goes from Brentford, who lauded him as their great goal scorer, to, to a, a a team where he might have to play a bit a bit part, really. Yeah, no chance. Like you said, he is so integral to Brentford's story, not just the team, just Brentford's story over the last few years. He's been front of centre of that, breaking goal scoring records in the Championship, keeping them up in the Premier League. I think it's important to point out that. Christian Eriksen, when he joined Brentford, he took Tony to another level, but it was Tony's goals which actually were the key thing, were the key difference as to why Brentford stayed up that season. Um, I think also Tony's personality is sometimes a little bit misrepresented though. Um, and there's no doubt he's a very confident guy. And I do think sometimes in interviews that comes across the wrong way. But actually... He's one of Brentford's vice captains for a reason, and he captained them multiple times last season. Um, every time a Brentford player does a club interview or, or speaks to a member of the media and is asked about Tony, they always say, talk about how much of a good character he is behind the scenes. I remember talking to Keane Lewis Potter at the end of last season about Tony. I think Keane Lewis Potter said when I first joined the club, you know, he really took me under his wing, um, really helped me out, just settle into the place, etc. So, yes, Tony is a striker who wants to play week in, week out, um, wants to break loads of goal-scoring records. But actually, if the opportunity to play for Man City came around to work under Pep Guardiola and you'd pick up 20 games a season in various competitions and have the chance to win Premier League, Champions League, we don't think it's going to happen. But I actually wouldn't be surprised if he said yes in that scenario. Yeah, for sure. I mean, second fiddle isn't so bad for him. I mean, he does it for England. Gareth Southgate spoke about how he hated being asked to come in last minute, you know, in that England match to the Euros. But you also see what he can do when he's given that time. As Jay said, trophies, Champions League, a Premier League title potentially, Liam, that's not bad for for a player who hasn't really won much at Brentford. Yeah, that's, that's fair. And look, by all means, I think I feel like there's very much a perspective in probably sports more generally now that sort of once a player hits 30, they're kind of just, you know, yeah, those funny things are like, oh, it's like, how is that body even holding up? How are they even sort of still going sort of thing where look, there's every chance he he goes, um, he goes over to Saudi, earns, earns well for a season, two seasons, then goes, look, I'm financially settled and secure. I've obviously got no idea what his finances are like, but to a position where he's comfortable and then goes, you know, I do want a few sort of trophies before I'm done or I do want to go back somewhere and, um, yeah, achieve a little bit more or, or have some more playing time or, or success on the pitch. Um, he might likewise, obviously with Southgate having uh, moved on from England, now there's going to be, a, a, um, I thought clean slates, the phrase that's always used mm -hmm. was, was sort of managed, but there's going to be a new opportunity now to impress under um, a, a New England head coach. Sure, Harry Kane's not going anywhere, mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's going to be a World Cup in, in not too uh, not too far away now, which will surely be BI up as well. So I think there's a, Still a lot of avenues with which this can go and different ways that this can still sort of play out. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me to see, yeah, this go a number of different ways. Yeah, Jay, I'm just looking at City, Arsenal, where Tony possibly might not have been the main man in, in that squad. But then there's another two names that we haven't mentioned. For me, West Ham were interesting. They bought Falkirk. Very similar kind of physical kind of presence, uh, much cheaper than Tony, obviously. But also, I know you watched Spurs last night against Leicester, Dominic Solanke going in that position as their new star striker, um, offered a fair bit, but you could also see Ivan Tony in that position, no? Yeah, I should have also said that I think on multiple occasions over the last couple of years, I've said maybe, I think, I think I've said it publicly. I've definitely said it privately. But I think <laughs> in the Sir Alex Ferguson era of Man United, he would have signed Tony in a heartbeat. I don't know why. Yeah. I just get this feeling that he was he's the type of player who... You know, Tony's got that little bit of about him, a little bit of a character. Ferguson was pretty good at signing players from 
teams lower down in the Premier League and sort of turning them into superstars. I always felt like that might end up being his destination. Um, West Ham's the one club I can't work, quite work my head around because Falkrook's 31 years old and has signed a four-year contract. And that seems like a pretty significant investment mm -hmm. on someone who, I know Liam was just mentioned the comment some people think that the second a player hits 30, their career's over. And as someone who's 30 next year, I'm starting to get a bit... <laughs> <laughs> a bit, a bit switchy well, I'm well past it then. I'm well past it then. <laughs> I'm starting to get a bit nervous myself. Um, but I just think, you know, Tony's 28 and I thought that deal would have made a lot of sense from West Ham's perspective and it would have been slightly more expensive than Fulcrook, but you would have had him for a longer period of time. He's someone that's proven in the Premier League, so there wouldn't really have been an adjustment needed. So I can't quite get my head around that. I think with Tottenham, Postacoglu had kind of spoken about Solanke being his number one target. Um, Solanke's movement is exceptional. He's, I think, 18 months younger than Ivan Tony. Um, obviously, he's coming off the back of his best season, whereas Tony's, you know, I think it was four goals in 17 games. So I can see why Tottenham decided to go for Solanke over Tony, basically. And certainly on the evidence of last night, yes, Solanke missed two good chances, which didn't feel like the biggest deal in the world at the time. But because Vardy then equalised, retrospectively, they probably feel and look worse than they are. But actually, the signs are there that he will be a real success at Tottenham. I think some of his link-up play with Madison was was really encouraging. But yeah, I think Solanke is the perfect fit on and off the ball for Ange Postacoglu. Yeah, Liam, on a tactical perspective, is there a shout to say that Ivan Tony could also work in a in a team like Spurs, um, considering they do now have Dominic Solanke? Yes, but Spurs are really specific. And if and it's quite a feature of, of Postacoglu's teams or anything, if you look at his Celtic team as well, his, his strikers tend to come out pretty much bottom in terms of touches. The job really is sort of stand occupied defenders, be in a position to to attack cutbacks. It's why he managed to mix sort of between Richardson and Son Heung Min at the start of last season. And we're just scoring sort of the same cutback goal from from either sort of side on repeat of just, you know, fizzing a low cross and, and being there. Um I think Slank is probably a little bit sort of more versatile um in the way that he can play. Um again, very much played an isolated role as a as a number nine with a, a number ten behind him. Um at Bournemouth, I think and I recall him actually, I think this was at Brentford um, earlier on in the season, scoring a really, really nice goal where he got released in the channel, sort of took his time 1v1, managed to shift the ball wide. Um, he's just kind of that striker that can, yeah, play in so many different ways, score a real sort of variety of goals. Um, and then I think if a club has a, a number one choice like that, um, and obviously he's not coming with any of the caveats that Tony is in terms of um, mm -hmm. whatever's happening off the pitch, um, I think we can't ever underestimate that from a club that's going to spend how many tens of million millions of pounds on a player to say, I need to know that for the best case scenario, I'm going to get this player sort of all the time. When you think of how many injuries as well, Spurs had last season, and um, say, so, yeah, I need sort of guarantee with this with this striker. Um, so I think Pascal was saying quite quite honestly on on Sky last night that um, their depth just kind of wasn't wasn't good enough or good enough to be at the level that they wanted to be which felt quite damning for him to honestly to come out and sort of say publicly especially pre-match um, but I think that kind of explained why Right let's move on to th this conversation around the the, the Saudi Pro League uh, we mentioned at the top of the pod that Ivan Tony expressed his interest to, to, to play for a top club in the Premier League um, Jay look there are a couple of players in the Euros this summer, in Golo Conte, Carrasco, for instance, that ply their trades in, in leagues that aren't as massive, like the Saudi Pro League, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, another one. Has this hindered his prospect of, of playing for, for England again, if he does end up playing in the Saudi Pro League, Ivan Tony? I think it does, but obviously it's hard to tell until Gareth Southgate's um, successor is appointed. So when Henderson moved to our Etifac last year, he was called up, for, I think, for the September internationals. But obviously Henderson and Tony have very different places in Southgate's tenure at England, right? Henderson was one of um, Southgate's key lieutenants. Um, played at the 2018 World Cup, 2022 World Cup, at the Euros, etc. I know he missed the tournament, just gone. But he was someone who was consistently there from the beginning. Whereas Tony, someone who's played... I think six times for England and has only mm. started once. So it feels like a really risky move to step away from the limelight in the Premier League and go to a league where you're probably not going to be watched nearly as much. People aren't going to be talking about you as much. And 
considering his positive contributions to England at the Euros, you know, it looked like England were out when he came off the bench against Slovakia. All of a sudden, he occupies a defender from a long throw-in. Bellingham equalises. Then he scores that penalty against Switzerland in the quarterfinals. It feels like he has a role to play in the next tournament cycle for the World Cup in 2026. And I think just going to the Saudi Pro League probably hinders his chances of doing that. So I think it would be a shame if he takes that decision. Yeah, and, and the options available, Liam. Um, Wally Watkins, another... <laughs> Brentford graduate, um, you know, Cole Palmer, Jude Bellingham. I mean, we talk about spreading the goals. There's a fair few people that can also contribute if Ivan Tony is not in that squad. Yeah, England have got a real, I suppose, a problem of abundance now of, of real sort of talented players. You look at the 21s that have just come off the back of um, winning the Euros as well. You've got likes of Gordon, who played as a false nine in, in that tournament. And likewise, sort of, I think, got about two or three kicks of the ball um, out in Germany. So, I'm I'm mixing it to be honest because I think what what Tony needs right now is is regular game time um and to get you know honestly just back scoring goals again I think regardless mm -hmm. of where you're playing if you're not doing either of those two things then coach aren't going to look at you in the first place um the Henderson example I think is is useful but I think again it, this is if memory serves this might not be quite correct but I believe the reason why Henderson wasn't considered was sort of more of a, a physical thing they were saying they weren't sure of the intensity whether he could still sort of compete and I suppose that's even more important for, for a midfielder in terms of the pace of the game and with someone like Henderson who's going to do a lot of sort of box-to-box -box play I wonder if a tone it's a little bit easier if you're saying okay if you go and score hypothetically 20-30 goals in the same number of games uh, sure if it's a if it's a lower quality league um, there's a a caveat on what that might translate to elsewhere but if you've been regularly scoring um and again he i think he'll, he'll possibly always have a role just because of how good he is as a penalty taker mm -hmm. but like southgate kind of reading between the lines said that after the shootout where he said look i said to tony his role might be just coming on and, and taking a penalty um if there's 26 man squads in the next world cup um, which i imagine there will be um international football is as a knockout format is always mm -hmm. going to have a place for that so um it might close the door a bit more, but I think it, it will never be completely shut because the way international football works, people will never to be get injured. People will drop out of form. People will come into form. All I hear from sort of selectors and, and coaches is you can never cut someone out entirely or you don't want to cut someone out entirely because you never know when you might need to sort of fall back on them. The Benjamin White example is probably quite a clear one of England sort of needing more fullbacks all of a sudden going into a, a major tournament. Um, so I think, yeah, for, for all involved... That would never be a, a tie that's completely cut. Um, but I agree with what Jay's saying. I think you're, uh, yeah, it, nothing competes to doing it in the Premier League on the biggest stage, right? I do yeah. think quickly before, I think we're going to finish shortly, but I do think it would be a shame if he goes to the Saudi Pro League because he is a box office player. I think he's one of those players that opposition fans love to hate, but secretly probably quite admire mm. because we're always talking about him. I remember a goal he scored against Leeds a couple of years ago. It was a hat trick, but it was when he um, chipped Elan Melia. Is that the one he chipped? The yes, that was a great goal, wasn't it? He always had this ability to just step up when required. Even the free mm. kick he scored against Nottingham Forest in January and the whole foam gate incident. He's a player that's always entertained. Um, you know, I think the first goal he scored in the Premier League for Brentford, he um, was against Aston Villa and he celebrated by basically making a reference to Birmingham's ultras. It's just that he, he would always do something which caught people's attention. So mm -hmm. I've no doubt that if he goes to the Saudi Pro League, we'll still see Twitter compilations of his goals, etc. But I think to not see him week in, week out on match of the day and in the stadiums up and down the country would be a shame because after that season where he scored 20 goals in 33 games, it would have been amazing to see him go to one of the teams we talked about. So it is a bit of a shame that's never happened. But then... The app was because of the ban and he got banned because of his own silly mistakes. So mm. it's a shame, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, definitely worth remembering that. Gents, let's end it there. Jay, Liam, thank you so much for your time. And don't forget, you can get in touch with us by emailing tafc at theathletic.com. We'll be back tomorrow delving into the biggest story of the day. Speak then. Bye-bye. If you want to watch more episodes of the show, please subscribe to the channel. We'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein, Matt Slater, Adam Crafton, Carl Anker, and plenty more through the season. If you'd like to listen to the episodes in full in audio form, search The Athletic FC wherever you get your podcasts from.